The theory of evolution that was advanced in the 19th century denies this evident fact of creation. This theory holds that the species on Earth were not created by God, but came into being as a result of processes governed entirely by chance. The founder of this theory was an amateur naturalist named Charles Darwin. Darwin expounded this theory in his book, The Origin of Species, which was published in 1859. Darwin's book was an instant success, but its popularity was due more to the ideological implications of the book rather than its scientific worth. Darwin's ideas provided considerable support for the materialistic philosophy which denied the existence of God. The founder of dialectical materialism, Karl Marx, dedicated his book Das Kapital to Darwin and wrote on the cover, to Charles Darwin from a devoted admirer. Darwin's theory argued that all species descended from a common ancestor by means of little cumulative changes in long periods of time. Darwin could advance no sound evidence to prove this claim. Indeed, he was himself aware of the great many facts that invalidated his theory. He admitted these in his book in a chapter entitled, Difficulties on Theory. Darwin's hope was that these difficulties would be overcome by new scientific discoveries. But in fact, advances in science would refute Darwin's claims one by one. Darwin proposed that all species evolved successively from a common ancestor. But how did that first living thing come into being? Darwin did not address this question at all in his book. He was not even aware that this point was one of the biggest refutations of his theory. The primitive understanding of science in his day assumed that life had a very simple structure. According to a theory called spontaneous generation, which was popular since the medieval age, it was believed that living things could easily arise from non-living matter. It was commonly thought that frogs spontaneously arose from mud and bugs from food leftovers. And some curious experiments were designed to prove these theories. A handful of wheat was left on a rag and mice were expected to arise from the mixture. The maggots on meat were also taken as evidence that life could generate from non-living matter. But later it was understood that such maggots did not form spontaneously, but that they emerged from microscopic larvae deposited on the meat by flies. And in Darwin's time, the belief that microbes could emanate easily from non-living materials was very common. But five years after the publication of The Origin of Species, the famous French biologist Louis Pasteur scientifically refuted these myths that lay ground for evolution. Pasteur, after lengthy studies and experiments, reached this very important conclusion. Can matter organize itself? No. Today there is no circumstance known under which one could affirm that microscopic beings have come into the world without parents resembling themselves. The first evolutionist to take up the issue of the origin of life in the 20th century was the Russian biologist Alexander Oparin. His aim was to explain how the first living cell, the alleged common ancestor of all living beings according to the theory of evolution, could emerge. In the 1930s, Oparin formulated a number of theories to show how the first living cell could arise from inanimate matter by chance. However, his efforts ended in failure, and Oparin himself had to confess. Unfortunately, the origin of the cell remains a question that is actually the murkiest aspect of the whole theory of evolution.
evolutionists that followed O'Parrot conducted experiments to find an evolutionist explanation to the origin of life. The most famous of these experiments was conducted by the American chemist Stanley Miller in 1953. Miller obtained a few simple organic molecules by triggering a reaction among gases that he claimed would have been present in the primitive Earth atmosphere. At the time, this experiment was regarded as a scientific proof for evolution. It turned out to be no such thing at all. Later discoveries showed that the gases used in the experiment were very different from the gases that had been present in the early atmosphere of the world. Miller himself eventually admitted to the invalidity of his experiment. Every evolutionist attempt in the 20th century to account for the origin of life has ended in failure. Jeffrey Beta, a professor of geochemistry and a leading advocate of the theory of evolution, confesses this fact in the February 1998 issue of Earth, one of the leading periodicals of evolutionist literature. Today, as we leave the 20th century, we still face the biggest unsolved problem that we had when we entered the 20th century. How did life originate on Earth? The biggest impasse confronting evolution is the incredibly complex structure of the living cell. Every living thing on Earth is made up of cells about a hundredth of a millimeter in size. Some living things are made up of a single cell. Yet even these single cell organisms are remarkably complex in their composition. They have complicated functions to survive and even little motors to move. In Darwin's time, this complex structure of the cell was unknown. With the primitive microscopes of those days, cells appeared to be little more than featureless stains. However, powerful electron microscopes invented around the middle of the 20th century began revealing just how complex and organized a living cell really was. They laid bare a complexity and organization that could not be a product of chance. A living cell is comprised of thousands of tiny parts that work in harmony. To make a comparison, within the cell, there are power stations, high-tech factories, a complex data bank, huge storage systems, advanced refineries, and a seemingly conscious cell membrane that controls what enters and leaves the cell. In order for the cell to survive, all of these organelles have to exist at the same time. It is impossible that such an intricate and complex system could have emerged as a result of coincidences. Today, not even the most sophisticated laboratory has been able to produce a single living cell from non-living matter. Indeed, this is fully acknowledged to be impossible, and efforts to produce living cells from non-living matter have been abandoned. But the theory of evolution claims that this system which man with all his intelligence, knowledge and technology cannot succeed in reproducing, came into existence by chance. Sir Fred Hoyle, a prominent English mathematician and astronomer, explains the impossibility of this with an example. The chance that higher life forms might have emerged by chance is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. It is evident that the DNA, the cell, and all living beings 
are products of an exalted and perfect creation. And since such a creation truly exists, then there must also be a creator who has an eternal power, knowledge, and wisdom. Whatever living being we observe in nature, we behold what great power the Creator has. Each of the millions of living things and species in nature is a work of art. And like every work of art, they introduce to us the artist to whom they owe their existence.